Hi, I'm Faye Harrison. I'm an associate here in the commercial IT and data protection team at Bristow's. And I'm Neelam Das. I'm also an associate in the commercial IP and IT team. And today we're going to talk to you about robots and data protection. The use of robots is becoming very commonplace in a wide range of fields, um, anything from medicine to home care to the security sector. Um, and of course the functionality and capabilities of these emerging robots technologies do vary greatly. Um, however, one key feature that we see with a lot of these technologies is that they have an ability to collect and process vast volumes of data, um, which can present potentially wide-ranging benefits and opportunities for those who have access to and can make use of this data. For example, think of a driverless car involved in a collision. The data that this car could provide could range anywhere from the location of the collision, the speed of impact, the sex and age of the passengers, and all of this information could potentially increase the response times and also the survival rate of the passengers involved. The extensive surveillance capabilities of drones could also help police prevent and detect crimes which would have otherwise gone under the radar. Of course there's always a flip side to perceived benefits um, and whilst we can see that there's a lot to be gained from using these mass volumes of data, there's also potentially significant privacy risks in relation to the individuals who are the subjects of this data. We therefore need to look to strike a balance between deriving the maximum benefit from these vast data sets, um, but also ensuring a good level of compliance with applicable data protection legislation, which includes the Data Protection Act 1998 here in the UK. And today we're going to talk you through some of the key data protection principles which apply to robotics technologies. The Data Protection Act applies to the processing of personal data, and whether the Data Protection Act applies to a particular entity depends on whether that entity is considered to be the data controller. And essentially, a data controller is the entity that decides how and why the data is processed. So in order to assess the application of the Data Protection Act to robot technology specifically, it's important to consider how its principles can be interpreted in respect of technologies that most likely weren't envisaged at the time that the Data Protection Act was drafted over 20 years ago. The first principle we're going to look at under the Data Protection Act is that data must be processed fairly and lawfully. Um, and as part of this requirement, the individuals whose data is being collected, known as the data subjects, must be informed of the identity of the data controller and also the purposes for which the data controller intends to use their personal data. However, identifying the data controller in the case of robots can be tricky. Think about a care robot in the home, for example. These care robots can check vital signs such as blood pressure and temperature and then decide what kind of medicine the patient should be taking and the dosage of the medication that the patient should be taking. But in these circumstances, who's the data controller? If the robot is somehow interacting with the GP, perhaps the GP is the data controller. If the robot is interacting with some kind of online system, maybe the app provider is the data controller. Potentially, the robot itself could be the data controller, but then how do you require a robot to comply with the data protection legislation? And how do you punish a robot for not complying with the data protection legislation? Also, consider the example of a civil drone surveying a landscape. Often, the data subjects on the ground would have no idea that there are civil drones flying above them. And in these circumstances, how would they know who this data controller is or the fact that their data is being processed in the first place? And actually taking that example of drones specifically, um, the Article 29 Working Party has come up with a number of suggestions on how to notify the public of use of drones that will be collecting their personal data. Um, and this guidance covers off informing the individuals or members of the public of who the data controller is, what data they're collecting, and also the purposes for which this data is processed. Um, so some examples of the recommendations include erecting signposts um, in an area where there is permanent drones that inform anyone passing by that a drone is in use in that area. Similarly, for specific events, leaflets could be issued to attendees, um, letting them know that a drone will be used at that event, who's operating it, what data is going to be collected and what, for what purpose. Another way in this day and age um, of getting the message out there, of course, is social media, which is a great way of kind of publicising the event and letting all the attendees know that, in fact, a drone is going to be used. 
There's also the option of simply making the drone very visible, so flying nearby, perhaps it's quite large in size, so that individuals are very aware of it, um, and if they wish to exercise their rights under the Data Protection Act, they have the opportunity to do so. Ideally, a form of multi-tiered approach is the best way forward, um, so combining some of these different options together to ensure that the members of the public are fully informed of the use of the drone and the fact that it is collecting and using their personal data. The second data protection principle is in respect of purpose limitation. Now, under this principle, the Data Protection Act requires that data controllers process data, personal data, for a specified purpose, and that all processing of this data is compatible with that purpose. Consider the example of a rented driverless car. It's likely that the passengers of this rented driverless car would have consented to the data controller processing their data in order to get the passenger from point A to point B. But what about all the other information that this driverless car could collect, such as lifestyle information, if the passenger goes to a particular restaurant a couple times a week or goes to the gym every single day, or even the place of worship that this passenger goes to? If the passenger has not consented to the driverless car processing this additional lifestyle data, there would be a clear violation of the second data protection principle. So moving on, we have the third data protection principle, which requires that a data controller processes the minimum personal data necessary to fulfill the intended purpose, um, as identified under the second principle, as Neelam's just talked about. As we talked about earlier, robots have huge capacity for collecting mass volumes of data um, and also wide-ranging data sets. And one thing that really sets robots apart from humans is the fact that they can go places that humans have never been and see things that humans simply can't see um, using highly sophisticated sensors and processing systems. Um, this of course significantly increases their capability to collect and process data. Consider for example a robot that goes into an individual's home, which is clearly in a very intimate and private setting, it may get access to huge volumes of data that simply wouldn't have been accessible before to an ordinary human entering that home. One way to achieve data min minimization is through the concept of blurring. A drone could use blurring functionality to de-identify individuals whose identification is not necessary for the purposes for which the data was collected. The idea of blurring can be used in a number of contexts. Um, for example, in the case of location data, um, a data controller should always consider how detailed it needs the data to be. For example, if a robot is collecting information about the location of individuals within a particular building, does it need to simply know that they're in that building, or should it also know what room they're in or what floor they're on? Um, the data controller will need to consider whether this finer detail is required for the intended purpose, and if not, that data should be blurred. The seventh and final data protection principle that we're going to talk to you about today is in relation to data security. And under this principle, a data controller must take appropriate technical and organizational security measures against the unauthorized or unlawful processing of personal data and against accidental loss or destruction or damage to personal data. The current and developing robotics technologies that Faye and I have been talking about present a number of security concerns, which will need to be managed if they are to operate in compliance with the DPA. What may be appropriate in any given circumstance really depends on the nature of the data and the likelihood of this, this data being compromised. A drone may be used to monitor crops, um, and from time to time it may inadvertently take a photo of somebody who's entered the field for a walk, let's say. In that situation, it's likely that not particularly stringent security measures are going to be needed in relation to that personal data that's collected. However, if you've got a care robot that's managing the personal affairs of perhaps an, an elderly person, it may have access to all sorts of sensitive information from their bank details to their daily medical needs. Um, and this type of information clearly needs greater protection. It's susceptible to things like hackers, um, identity fraud, and therefore robust and stringent security measures will need to be in place. And an even more extreme example of that is a surgical robot which is communicating with a surgeon operated console. You can imagine the potentially dire consequences on the patient if this extremely sensitive health data is compromised or interfered with. Security also ties in with another principle under the Data Protection Act, 
um, which is the requirement that personal data is not retained for longer than it needs to be in connection with the, its intended purpose. Um, security measures should therefore include strict data storage and deletion schedules to ensure that personal data isn't kept longer than it should be, but also that it's securely deleted. So we've talked about a lot of the privacy issues that arise in relation to robotics technologies and we're now going to take a quick look at some of the best practice recommendations for addressing these risks and issues. In June of 2015, the Article 29 Working Party adopted an opinion which is specifically aimed at the capability of drones. Um, however, it does provide a useful baseline for considering privacy issues presented by robots more generally. A lot of the guidance centres around steps that should take place in the design and development stage of, of new robotic technologies, um, ensuring privacy from an early stage. Within this we have the principle of privacy by design, which essentially means that a new technology should be designed with privacy in mind from the outset, rather than trying to address privacy issues when you're a lot further down the line and perhaps it's, it's difficult to change the functionality of the technology by that stage. Along the same lines, robotics technology should also incorporate security by design. So again, this is the idea that security is in mind from day one of development rather than trying to address it down the line. Another key principle to follow under the Working Party's recommendations is privacy by default. And this is the idea that as a default setting, robotics technologies should be limited in the personal data that they're collecting and processing to the minimum extent necessary, but also that they shouldn't be retaining personal data for longer than is necessary. Finally, along the lines of the kind of recommendations for development and design is that the Working Party recommends that privacy impact assessments are carried out in the early stages of development of a new technology. I have a few more to add to that list. There should be information in the packaging or operating instructions of the robotics technology or as part of the online setup, if appropriate. And this information should explain the poten potential intrusiveness of the technology and also the relevant bits from the privacy policy. Users should also be able to change their privacy settings relatively easily. Data minimization should also be a key feature. So talking about the example of the, dri the driverless car, it would make sense for the driverless car to have to retain information to get the passenger from point A to point B, but it's probably not necessary for the driverless car to retain a historic record of the journeys that this passenger has taken. Data controllers should also involve the data protection officer in the creation of policies and ensure that the data processed by a robot is reviewed by a human at some point. Data controllers should ensure that they implement policies and guidelines to ensure that the data protection principles are met. So looking to the future, the Data Protection Act is ultimately to be replaced by the General Data Protection Regulation, um, or GDPR, in May of 2018. The intention of the GDPR is to update data protection legislation in light of current and emerging technologies, including things like robots, um, but is also likely to give individuals greater control over their personal data. Of course, the law always faces challenges in trying to keep up with the pace at which technology develops, um, and evidently there will be technologies being developed right now which the drafters of the GDPR haven't envisaged. It's worth noting that some of the Working Party's guidance that we've been talking about is enshrined into law within the GDPR, um, including in particular the principle of privacy by design um, and also the requirement to carry out privacy impact assessments, which will both become legal requirements under the new legislation. One of the biggest changes we're going to see with the GDPR is that it imposes direct obligations on data processors. So those are the entities that process personal data on behalf of data controllers. So providers of robotic technologies that simply process data on behalf of a data controller will have their own compliance obligations and will need to be ensuring that they meet these. This is very different to the current situation where only the data controllers have obligations under the Data Protection Act. Another big change is the maximum fine which the ICO can impose under law. Currently, the ICO can impose fines of up to £500,000, but in practice, to date, the highest fine has only been £350,000. Under the GDPR, 
the maximum fine will now be the greater of 20 million euros or 4% of worldwide global turnover. This is clearly a huge change and also it's worth noting, as mentioned before, that this will apply to both controllers and data processors. Therefore, more than ever, it's very important for data controllers and data processors operating robotics technologies to ensure that they achieve a sufficient level of compliance with the relevant legislation. Thank, Thank you. you.